This is CBC Here and Now. I'm backstage at a fashion show at The Rooms, but it's not all just about the pretty clothing. They're also celebrating cultural diversity tonight. I'll bring you more on that story coming up on Here and Now. For me personally, if you weren't a little bit nervous, there'd be something wrong. He's been training for months. A St. John's mountain climber is Everest bound. Mark Ballard's story ahead tonight on Here and Now. Good evening, and I'm Anthony Germain. Vague rumors, well, they've been swirling for months now, and today we can finally tell you more about when to expect a provincial election. Here now is Katie Breen has the details. So, Katie, when will we finally be heading to the polls? Well, sometime before the end of June. That's as much as the Premier would say today. He plans to hold an election before school is out, but he wouldn't narrow it down any more than that. When I'm not focused on a date. I'm still focused on what we're doing for the people of the province. We've been extremely busy, of course, with the Accord, attracting investment to the province, but there's still some issues that we need to deal with. And insurance, as an example, is one of those. We've got to get a budget sometime. You know, now in April is when the finance minister have already said. So I'm not really focused on the date, but I think it's fair to say today that this election will be over. The provincial election will be over before uh, school closes for 2019. Now, the parties have been preparing for this. Some candidates are already out campaigning. The Liberals and the PCs have confirmed many of their hopefuls, and the NDP opened up all its nominations yesterday. Here's what oppositions had to say, opposition leaders rather, had to say today. Well, we are not at all surprised by it. I mean, it certainly was an expectation. Uh, however, it is a little early, which is unfortunate. I expect that it was done for a very good political reason. What reason is that? Uh, I expect they were trying to uh, catch the opposition parties off guard. Bring it on. We're, uh, the thing is, he could have held it in, say, November, right? He could go that, that long. He wants to avoid a conflict with October and the federal election. That's fine, but what he knows is that every week that passes, every month that passes, the PC party gets stronger and he gets weaker. The Premier can call an election any time now, really, and when he does, there will be a month of campaigning before voters head to the polls. One other thing to note, you heard Ball mention the Atlantic Accord earlier. He had said in the past that he'd reach a deal with the federal government by the 31st or Sunday. Today, he said he'd have information to share on that Monday. Anthony? All right, that's Katie Breen live in our studio. Of course, Katie will be there next week when the House resumes for what will be the uh, last time before the next election, as it turns out. Staying with politics to a certain degree, the Public Service Alliance of Canada is pressuring Seamus O'Regan to help members get a new contract. PSAC has been at the bargaining table just short of a year now, but it wants the MP's support. A few members visited O'Regan's office today demanding to speak to him. The union says it's looking for a better work-life balance. It also wants to see a more contemporary interpretation of the meaning of family leave. Most importantly, the union says it's still waiting for a fix on the Phoenix pay system fiasco. It's extremely hard, I mean, to go to work every single day and do your job and not know if you're going to get paid properly or paid at all. It's really frustrating to a lot of members. People are afraid to take promotions. They're afraid to take acting positions and advance in their career because they don't know if they're going to get paid the appropriate amount or if they'll get paid at all, really. We deliver the goods, and today uh, that particular industry is flat ass broke. Ahead, criticisms of confederation Low from someone who was there for the vote. In North America. This in the days leading up to the 70th anniversary marked on the weekend and Monday. Well, this week we've been showing you the thick ice clogging the Strait of Belle Isle. The ferry has barely run in the last month, stranding people and freight. Diane Lake is waiting for a house full of stuff that should have been in St. John's weeks ago. And she shared her story with the CBC's Peter Cowan. Well, my dishes are, I have like two plates, two mugs, and a few dishes. Uh, and all of this was what was left. My name is Diane Lake. I lived and worked in Labrador for 17 years and have been trying to move out of there since uh, the early, the end of February, early part of March. The roads have either been closed or the ferry hasn't been running. So my stuff is all still in Labrador on a truck. I didn't plan on not having the being this long without it because I only packed for a week or so that figured, you know, it. At worst, with the weather, you know, you you could have delays with snow and whatnot. So, you know, give it a week or two. But 
I didn't bring what I would have brought if I knew I wasn't going to have my stuff for an extended period of time. What are you missing the most? Uh, oh, just a lot of, I go looking for stuff and think, oh, crap, it's in Labrador. <laughs> Uh, just a lot of your everyday dishes, linens, towels, uh, none of pretty much what's here was here when I bought it. Uh, just having your own stuff around, pictures, uh, you can't really do anything and you can't really plan on when uh, you're going to get it at this point. And my car, probably the biggest thing is my car not having my vehicle, it's on the truck too. This is mother nature that you, uh, you know, expected, I expected delays. I knew I was in Labrador in winter. I didn't expect that it would be a month before. And I'm, I'm here not even knowing when I'm gonna get my stuff because until the ferry runs again, uh, it won't be able to cross. Now, Diane could ship her stuff through Quebec and the Maritime Provinces, but she was told that would cost her an additional $6,000. And she's not the only person waiting. Two tourists from France drove from Montreal through Labrador, and they've spent days waiting to try to cross the ferry and get to Newfoundland. Their biggest complaint? It's been hard to get information about if or when that ferry is going to move. We might not be able to visit Newfoundland, which would be... Um a bit sad for us because every everybody here in Labrador is telling us that it's really beautiful and it's something to see once uh, in a lifetime and maybe we, we won't make it. That would have been better to get more information uh, on the website during the trip saying that careful uh, the probability of crossing during the next maybe 10 or 15 days will be uh, near zero and therefore we wouldn't have done uh, that trip. Yeah, and the latest forecast, uh, we talked about this earlier in the week, but the latest forecast for that ice to move out of the way probably isn't until at least the middle of April, and uh, definitely uh, not good news there. But if we take a look at the map right now, these are the current ice conditions. We'll zoom in a little bit so you can see uh, that dense ice is right through the Strait of Belle Isle. Moving down a little bit further, we can see it uh, creeping further south, and then as we head towards the... Uh, south or the eastern portion of the island uh, not so much seeing that ice right now but how does it form so what happens is we have to have some calm winds and uh, cold temperatures which we've seen a lot this uh, winter over the St. Lawrence, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence. And with that, we've got, that's how that ice forms. And then we've got these prevailing southwesterly winds, which we've also seen quite a bit. And that pushes that ice right through the Strait of Belle Isle. Now, the only way to get rid of that ice, first of all, is those warmer temperatures, which we're starting to see as we head towards the uh, beginning of April. And then we need those winds to shift to more northeasterlies, and that's to push all of that ice right back to where it came from and then hopefully break that up. So that's a look at how that ice forms. Uh, now, I mentioned those warmer temperatures as we head towards the weekend. That's mainly for the island. Much more snow on the way for Labrador, but I'll have all those details coming up. Anthony? Well, thanks, Ashley. Some very strange creatures are walking the streets of downtown St. John's, and it's not just because it's Friday night. It's Sci-Fi on the Rock. The annual convention brings together fans of science fiction, fantasy, comic books, video games, and a lot more. And apparently, it's twice the fun if you're actually wearing a costume. Here now, Zach Gowdy met some of the best dressed as well as some of the celebrity guests. This weekend, we have Sci-Fi in the Rock 13. We've got the biggest sci-fi fantasy convention in the province. The energy here is crazy. Everybody looks forward to this all year long. They can't wait to come here. It's almost like a Christmas for nerds when they all come together and celebrate it uh, over a weekend. This is a great time to come out with all your costumes. You get to meet people that, you know, you know, that understand you. The suit I purchased, uh, the claws I made, the belt, uh, all the accessories were mine. The mask itself is done by CFX. They're just in LA. They help mold this one. This is six weeks. My girlfriend is uh, does a bit of seamstress. She helped do the costume. With all that work, how does it feel to be here showing it off? It feels toasty. I'm very, very hot inside this thing. First of all, they will recognize my voice from the Deadpool movies because I play Colossus. 
I'm a comic book geek, so I was on the other side, you know, so for so many years until I became a colossus. So now, I, but I, so that's why I can feel the both sides. I can understand them, and I, you know, I was, I am one of them. I think the best thing about meeting the fans is to see the ways that the show affected their life. Some of them became scientists. Some of them just just love um, the idea of a utopia where people get along and they're compassionate and understanding. And so it feels good to be at a convention. It's hugely important because the love of various fandoms, sci-fi, anime, history, futuristic, anything, there are so many people who like so many things of that. And it's hugely important to the community both to be gathered as one and celebrate this, and also just to just indulge in all of our likes and fans. Bit of fun there. Well, this weekend marks the 70th anniversary of Newfoundland joining Confederation. And there are few people alive today who were actually there when we joined Canada back in 1949, and even fewer who actually cast a ballot in that historic vote. But here now is Mark Quinn caught up with one such person and has this report. Lowest standard of family living in North America. The lowest standard. Newfoundland was broke. And in the years following the hardships of the Great Depression and World War II, Joey Smallwood pushed hard for confederation with Canada. There was a, a lot of ill feeling, there's no doubt about that, between people and uh, friends and families in some cases. A razor-thin majority, 52% of Newfoundlanders voted for confederation. But 95-year-old Gus Echegary was not one of them. He liked the idea of economic union with the U.S., but that wasn't on the ballot. In the final analysis, I voted for a responsible government. Uh, we have reached an agreement for the entry of Newfoundland as a province of Canada. It was, uh, to many of us, a sad day. Etchegary worked in the fishing industry for 60 years. He blames Confederation for its demise. Marytown alone, for example, 1,100 full-time jobs went out the window. And the moratorium that occurred in 1992 as a direct result of Canadian mismanagement of our resource. Make no mistake about that. You know, there are other nations around the world where the fishery has been depleted as it is in Newfoundland. So if we had been an independent nation, uh, would we have managed our fishery, for example, differently? I suspect not. Raymond Blake is from Hermitage on Newfoundland's south coast but he's a history professor in Saskatchewan now. I think Newfoundland has prospered within Canada. I don't think there's any fear of a return to, you know, the troubles that small nations around the world have had. So Confederation on the O was, you know, I, I think a, a right decision. Dissenting voices like Echegary's are disappearing, but he hopes to keep the debate going at least for a few more years. So hopefully I'll be talking to you again on the uh, 75th <laughs> when you'll be 100. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> Mark so Quinn, CBC day. News, St. John's. <laughs> well, still to come, the host of CBC Radio's The Broadcast takes us to the Folk Fest. Folk, of course, being the French word for seal. All these dishes include seal meat, that and your X-rated French lesson is ahead.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is midnight, Friday, April 5th. Order now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Had a chance today to walk from the CBC here over to the campus of Memorial University, which is right mm -hmm. next door. It was gorgeous here. I don't know about the rest of the province, but it was really nice here today. It was really nice. Yeah. Once uh, had to scrape off the vehicles a little, a little bit. bit this morning, yeah. but uh, overall beautiful afternoon. Uh, temperatures this morning not quite as cool uh, as we've seen everywhere else. If you take a look at those temperatures sitting only in the minus single digits. The last couple of days we've been waking up to minus teens through parts of uh, the island and then mild up through Labrador as well. Minus two this morning for Happy Valley Goose Bay Lab City sitting at minus 14. Now those temperatures uh, recovered quite nicely sitting in the minus single digits uh, for Lab City minus two and then uh, my three degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then those temperatures in the single digits right across the board for uh, most of the island as well. Now a lot more cloud cover than we've been seeing for the past couple of days especially uh, that moved in late day towards uh, eastern Newfoundland. And then we've got some clearing skies up through Labrador, but not before we see some more snow as we head through the night tonight for uh, parts of the southeastern uh, Labrador. Otherwise, we're starting to see that precipitation or did start to see that precipitation move in this afternoon. Mainly the snow that's showing up is in higher elevations and then further inland, certainly down along the south coast. We are seeing uh, some pretty slippery conditions. Otherwise, as we head through the night tonight, we should start to see things change over to rain by morning, and that's because those temperatures are going to warm up. And then again, eventually uh, we'll see that snow move offshore and then in behind that clearing skies for uh, Labrador. And that's because that ridge of high pressure moves in. So that's certainly good news there. This is where we should be sitting is your overnight lows tonight. Minus one for Corner Brook, one degree on the plus side of the Mercury for Port of Basque, and then uh, zero degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor, and minus one for St. John's. Again, likely going to see uh, some uh, increasing cloud through the morning hours. And then that rain and or snow will make its way further east by morning, certainly for Gander. And then minus eight is your overnight low for St. Anthony. Up through Labrador, again, clearing skies as we head through the night tonight. Minus 20, your overnight low in Lab City. Minus 16 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And the straight should be sitting around minus 10. Now, looking ahead to tomorrow, it should clear out for most of the island and up through Labrador. Again, that's thanks to that ridge of high pressure. Likely for eastern Newfoundland and the Avalon, we're going to see some showers in the morning hours and then potentially hanging on to uh, mostly cloudy skies, maybe a few peaks of sun and then some lingering drizzle as well through the afternoon. Otherwise, those temperatures are going to be quite nice. So we should see uh, temperatures sitting between eight and or seven and eight degrees for the Avalon. Uh, the rest of the Biran Peninsula and up through uh, Bonavista in the minus or middle single digits. Westerly winds near 40 kilometers per hour, again, hanging on to that potential for some showers and then clearing skies as we head west. So Grand Falls winds are sitting around minus five tomorrow. Similar temperatures along the west coast. Now these will likely be flurries in the morning and then we'll see some clearing and that's just because those temperatures are going to be quite cold or rather hovering around the zero or minus one degree mark tonight. Uh, Lanzalute minus four tomorrow, minus four for Mary's Harbor as well. Again, those southwest winds near 40 kilometers per hour and then up through Labrador. Nice day in the minus single digits uh, late day though we're going to start to see some snow move in for lab city and then uh, it looks like a significant snow event for most of labrador but i'll have all those details when i come back well, when was the last time that you had a good feed of seal they'll soon be selling flippers on the st john's waterfront but if you were in quebec this week you would have lots and lots of opportunities to eat seal meat a culinary festival called Seal Fest has been running since last weekend, and host of the broadcast, Jane Aidy, was in La Belle Province for this, and she joins us here in the studio to tell us about Seal Fest. Now, <laughs> Seal Fest sounds entirely <laughs> different in French, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You say it first. <laughs> All right, so in French, uh, Seal is uh, phoque, which is spelled P H O Q U E, which is phoque fest. So if you're going to actually <laughs> Google that, use the French spelling, <laughs> otherwise you might get uh, particularly upset. All right, so it's Folkfest. It is a Folkfest uh, or Seal Fest. So you can imagine we've had a few giggles I, yes, about that in the apparently. newsroom this week. Uh, anyway, yes, so this is the second annual uh, Seal Festival in Montreal and Quebec City. There were about 20 restaurants uh, that took part, all of them serving at least one seal dish on their menu. Okay, so why are the restaurants uh, doing this, Jane? 
So this is a promotion by a company called CDNA. They sell seal meat and seal oil and even seal jerky. Mm -hmm. And uh, much of it is made with harp seal harvested in Newfoundland and Labrador and the Magdalene Islands in Quebec. So it's also supported by the Seals and Sealing Network of Canada, which supports sustainable use of seal. So these two groups are trying to create awareness about the Canadian seal hunt and the value of seal as food. And I should mention that the federal government mm -hmm. and the province of Quebec, Quebec are also supporting this uh, seal fest. Okay, so let's uh, get to the good stuff. Now tell me about all the food. Now, as we know, here in Newfoundland Labrador, seal flipper pie can be kind of good, depending on where you have it made, but how do the chefs prepare what, what you got to chance? So uh, this, this food was really uh, off the chart, I have to say. It was so creative. Good. I visited one restaurant where the chef had prepared a seal tataki. So that's a seal loin that's lightly seared with a fancy vinaigrette and it had clams on top. Another restaurant served seal saucisson, which is sausage, a very French lentil stew with mushrooms and red wine sauce. That was my favorite, I have to say. One chef I interviewed served seal for brunch, if you can imagine, a kind of seal pâté with a Bordelais sauce and poached eggs. And the last restaurant I visited, the chef had made a kind of seal pepperoni, and he served that with a, a plate of cheese and fruit and mussels. So that was also delicious. All right, well, sounds amazing. Were people ordering uh, these dishes, and what did they think? Yeah, there were lots of people who tried seal, many of them for the very first time, and I interviewed even a, a little seven-year-old who tried mm -hmm. it, and he loved it. And some people were really curious about why they'd never seen seal on a menu before. A lot of people said that they wondered even if it was legal to sell seal. Uh, so many people had a lot of questions for me about the seal hunt, how many seals there are, how they're hunted. Uh, many confess that they had negative attitudes about the seal hunt, but now understand that there might be another side to the seal sealing story that they hadn't heard before. But overall, people seem to love the dishes. All who tried them say they would eat it again. So this week, I aired two full shows on the broadcast about my trip to Seal Fest in Quebec City. The interviews with chefs and diners are really interesting and thought-provoking. So if you'd like to hear them, you can find them on the broadcast's website. You just go to cbc.ca slash the broadcast. Anthony? It's Jane Eady, host of the broadcast. In other news, some student entrepreneurs at Memorial University a lot richer today. Three teams were awarded $10,000 each at the Mel Woodward Cup. The winners include Poly Unity Tech, the founders of a biomedical 3D printing lab. Then there's Unbound Chemicals. That team pitched the idea of extracting chemicals from expired medications for use in research. And Duff Ocean Resources. You saw this idea last night on Here and Now. They want to use the ever invasive green crab for a bunch of different things, such as healing wounds, purifying water, and in agriculture. In a few minutes, I'm going to tell you why the rooms has been converted into a bit of a salon. That's coming up.
Welcome back to here now. Some diverse designs are being showcased later tonight in St. John's. Local designers are coming together to celebrate their cultures. Here now is Meg Roberts is at the room. So Meg, uh, what's going on down there? Well, there are no famous big fashion names here, but as you can see, there are some really gorgeous costumes. Now, the show has been put on by a program called the Creative Sewing Atelier. Uh, it introduces newcomers to they introduce them how to sew, and here is the final product. So, I've seen some really beautiful costumes from uh, China, from Ireland, from some. Peru, so a lot of diversity. I met up with a couple of them as they were getting their hair and their makeup done, and this is what they had to say. So today we will see more of 30 garments from 15 different countries. It's really good project. We start with beginner classes, so all these students are in intermediate classes, but they pass for um, beginners. So they learning and using skills. The multicultural aspect of this is really interesting. So why is that important? Well, it is important because um, this province uh, receive a lot of newcomers each day, and sometimes you start to learning about other cultures because you make friends from people from other cultures, but you don't know nobody from here. So this is the good part of the program because you enjoy with people fr who live here, local people. So what happened in classes is a real multicultural um, history, language, stories. So uh, I think that is the most important of this program because you can enjoy it to all the, ca the cultures who arrive here. I have been, he been living here in St. John's for two years and it has been a beautiful, amazing experience for me, for the family, for the kids, for everyone. Yeah, we love it here. Why did you come here? Uh, my husband was transferred from the company to work in the Voices Bay project. My creation is based um, in the typical uh, dress uh, from Chile. It's the, the one that they, in the past, in the 18th century, when the Spanish arrived there, the Chilean countryside ladies used to wear is is inspired in the work and the life of the country for a lady in those days. Uh, it's not elegant, it's like rough, it's like when the, the ladies were working and they decided in the evening to go for a party, they just wear the same thing as they were wearing during the day. I come from the countryside, so I think that uh, it represents it represent where, where I come from. What does it feel like being able able to show a creation that means so much to you back home here in St. John. Oh, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It connects you to home. It makes you feel warm and homely here, here in St. John's. Uh, it's a beautiful experience. It's, uh, to live here is very different. The weather, the people sometimes is different. But all this group of people from different nationalities, different countries, different cultures, it has been amazing to get them together, to meet them twice a week together, and to share our, our lives, our culture, our thoughts about St. John's, and at the same time appreciate this city, these countries that they, are, they welcome us. Now you just heard from Maria. Her daughter is actually wearing her outfit tonight, so she says she's real pleased about that. Now this event doesn't start until seven, so there's still time to get down well, here. You know uh, the only ask is that you wear an all-black outfit and wear some kind of emblem or some kind of uh, accessory that represents your culture. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Meg Roberts for Here and Now. All right, thank you, Meg. We'll be checking in with Meg too a little bit later on Here and Now. Another story now, during her career, Myra Bennett delivered about 5,000 babies. And that earned her the nickname the Florence Nightingale of the North. And she traveled by foot, by boat, and even dog sled to reach all of her patients along the isolated stretches of the Northern Peninsula before she retired in 1953. Well, now a West Coast theater is honoring the nurse with a new center for the arts in her name. Here's Bennett's daughter-in-law speaking at today's announcement. I met Nurse Bennett in 1948 when I was a young school teacher, and uh, I got to know her very well that year, and, she, and uh, I had no intention of marrying her son, I was, <laughs> but she, I was really impressed. She was a very, very, like you say, resilient woman. I saw her night after night go out into the evenings and dark nights and deliver babies and all that sort of thing, and I learned a lot from her even before I entered nurse's training. 
she was more than just a nurse because she was interested in music and she formed, when she was a young woman, she formed a choir, she did the choir gowns, she was the organist, she taught music lessons. Well, she did all the things in the community and she was very interested in, in the arts and performing and getting children interested in music. So that was another side that perhaps many people didn't know. However, uh, that's where I met Myra Bennett. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, Ju and June Perry, who's here, Myra Bennett brought her into the world. Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and, 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 mo and most of the people on the Great Northern Peninsula. Yeah. And, and, and stand up, Noel. Stand up, Noel. This is the only grandson she delivered on Christmas Day. And I invited her for dinner, yeah. and this is what happened. And, and they, yeah, yeah, and he came along. So that's <laughs>Welcome back to Here and Now. Should have mentioned earlier, Carolyn Stokes off tonight. A St. John's man has his sights set on making it to the highest peak in the world. Mark Ballard is heading to Nepal next month to attempt Mount Everest. But a trip like that, well, that takes years to prepare for. Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton reached Ballard via FaceTime from his home in Norway. The question is not, it's not so straightforward. It's uh, a little bit of maybe human nature in the sense I think most people that climb mountains that have started on something small and and I think the human nature pushes you higher and higher um, but I, I think I think for me it, that that was a part of it and uh, as a personal part uh, my father has uh, a couple of years ago lost uh, lost his leg from from diabetes and I, I watched him for the last three years had to push himself uh, whether it was just to get out of bed to uh, to being able to to sit up again and then finally uh, walk on uh, an amputated leg, and I think that has really inspired me to to push myself uh, higher and higher into uh, into my goals. Now, to push yourself to the top of Mount Everest takes a lot of training. So, how many hours would you put in a week, or how many months have you put in getting ready for this climb? So. Of course, for the the, the climbing part, uh, that that's been years. But uh, for specific training for this, it's been pretty pretty detailed. I I've, I started six months ago, and I've uh, 
I've trained basically two hours a day every day or what it averages out to. And, and that's been a combination of uh, strength training for legs and back, uh, cardio, and of course in the mountains, uh, hiking with uh, lots of weight on my back. So now to do this, uh, obviously it's the highest mountain in the world. Uh, so you must have started on something smaller. So how long have you been climbing and sort of what's the highest uh, mountain you've climbed so far? I started, I guess, the, not really climbing, but I started on the mountains back in uh, 2012 on kind of a, a random trip. I had a few buddies uh, going to Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, and I decided to join with them last minute, and uh, and we did that quite quickly, and, and I realized for me it was uh, quite straightforward and, and no problems with the altitude. and. And I think it started from there. I wanted to see if I could go higher and, and push it push it to harder mountains. And, and that's kind of led from there. So sort of explain to us, how does this work? You fly into Nepal. Do you hire uh, guides? Like, well, what happens when you land in Nepal uh, in early April? Yeah, so it, it is different. You can do it in lots of different ways. I have, uh, I have contacted a, a team, uh, one of the bigger teams that, uh, that organizes trips in, in Nepal. It's called International Mountain Guides. Um, they, they climb and, uh, and guide all over the world, uh, all the biggest mountains. So, so I team up with them. Uh, I'm a part of their team. And uh, when I land in, in Nepal, we get together and, and, and we go from there. Now, if, uh, if you are successful, how long uh, will this climb take? It's really weather dependent, uh, of course. It, it, the, the summit window can, be, uh, can come and go very quick. Yeah, I can have to wait for, for weeks at a time. So uh, I estimate anywhere between six and eight weeks I'll be uh, in Nepal and uh, climbing. Six to eight weeks sounds like a long time. Does that scare you at all? Does it scare your family or your friends? For me personally, if you weren't a little bit nervous, there'd be something wrong. But uh, for me, uh, people are more worried for me, I think, uh, from what I hear around uh, the people around me than, than what I am. So, <laughs> Is there anything sort of special that you've taken? Like, I, I know I've seen pictures of you on your Facebook page of you with a Newfoundland flag. Will you carry something like that in it uh, if you get to the top? For me, I'm really proud to be a Newfoundlander, and I, I climb that, or I carry that on, on, climb, on all my climbs. So the Newfoundland flag will definitely definitely join me on the top well and uh you're getting ready you'll head to nepal in early april so uh, we'll probably touch base with you in about two months and see how you did but uh, thanks so much for telling us about this mark yeah, i really appreciate it thank you yeah, i wish him good luck as well question for you would you pay 32 dollars for laundry detergent well in canada's north there may not be too many other options grocery prices often double or more than they are in the rest of canada now, in spite of a federal program to subsidize those costs, the situation has actually gotten worse. David Common reports. We paired two moms for a cross-country price check. How much did you pay for your pickles? Five thirty-nine, and I thought that was quite expensive. <laughs> I paid nine ninety-nine. So what's the difference? Megan Brisebois lives in Manitoba. Joelle and Pamiolik is in Nunavut, where groceries can cost twice as much. And then we also bought a case of water. We uh, did too. It was four forty nine. I paid twenty nine dollars and ninety five cents. <laughs> what? With no road access to Nunavut, fresh food has to be flown up. That's expensive. So the federal government spends a hundred million dollars a year subsidizing certain items. Meat, fruit, veg, and dairy prices are reduced. But other items aren't. It leaves many people making choices about what to buy and what to leave. It also means seven in ten kids in Nunavut go to bed hungry. It hurts to know that a child my daughter's age, who's only five, is actually hungry. It, it hurts. I can't imagine, and that's, that's, that's my daughter. In fact, since the federal government began the Nutrition North subsidy eight years ago, even more people are going hungry, unable to access nutritious food. I grew up in Labrador. The government's point person on Nutrition North is Yvonne Jones. Why should anybody have confidence that Nutrition North remains any part of the solution now? Nutrition North is one component. The problem has been thinking that Nutrition North alone could fix food insecurity. But you've been part of the government for four years now. Mm -hmm. This is still a problem. 
it is still a problem, but it's one that's getting addressed, and I think that's the key piece right now. Many Inuit are skeptical and suspicious, wondering how such hunger continues to exist in their communities in spite of an expensive federal program. David Coleman, CBC News, Iqaluit. A new political bombshell has dropped in Ottawa in connection with the SNC-Lavalin affair. Key materials submitted to the Commons Justice Committee by former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould have been made public. And among them, a recording of a phone conversation between Wilson-Raybould and the then Privy Council Clerk Michael Wernick. Here's an excerpt. Who uh, wants to be able to say um, uh, that he has tried everything he can uh, you know, within within a legitimate toolbox to try to head that off. Um, so he's he's quite determined, <laughs> quite firm. Uh, but he wants to he wants to know why the DPA route, which Parliament provided for, isn't isn't being used. And I think he's going to find a way to get it done one way or another. So um, he's in that kind of mood. And um, I wanted to be aware of that. Now, during the 17-minute conversation, Wilson Raybould warns Wernick several times that she considered his phone call inappropriate and political interference. And she says that she's confident she's not doing anything inappropriate. And Wernick continues to press her to reconsider a deferred prosecution of SNC-Lavalin, saying 9,000 jobs could be lost if the company has to go through a criminal trial. This weather update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. All right, the weekend is uh, upon us, so let's take a look at um, what's going to happen in the next couple of days. Where do you want to start? Well, let's start uh, on Sunday okay. with the snow in Labrador because right. uh, it looks like we're in for a little bit of a mess. So if we take a look at what the future tracker is saying, that snow will move in overnight Saturday through the day on Sunday. And uh, from what I can see so far, it looks like it's going to be pretty heavy at times. 
with this system. And then we start to get that push of warm air that I was talking about that's affecting uh, or at least keeping the temperatures quite warm for most of uh, the island is going to push further north. So uh, up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, overnight we could see that potential to uh, see things change over to rain. And then uh, same for the southeastern portion of Labrador and then further west as well. Now, um, Lab City should sit in the cold sector of this, uh, which means that should stay as snow and then up through uh, Nain and Hopedale as well. So if we take a look at uh, the amount of snowfall that's expected, now this is early, but there are a couple of uh, forecast models that are pointing at quite a significant event. So Lab City sitting in that 15 to 25 centimeter mark, and then we see that swath all the way through. Uh, generally looking at uh, those accumulations by the time Monday uh, morning rolls around or at least overnight sa Sunday into Monday morning and then more snow in behind that system as well. But with those temperatures sitting around minus three uh, for Lab City, that's why we're going to see that thing uh, mostly stay as snow. And then for Happy Valley Goose Bay, a changeover from snow through potentially some freezing rain over to uh, some wet snow or rain through the overnight. And that's because those temperatures are going to climb up. And you can see along the, the coast, though, uh, between four and five degrees. So uh, definitely a warm day, certainly uh, for the island between 10 to 13 degrees through parts of central. We should see a mix of sun and cloud and then that rain moving in in the evening and overnight hours and it looks like Monday is going to stay quite wet. So here's a look at uh, what the future tracker is saying for Monday morning again. Uh, generally green, which is rain for most of the island and southeastern portions of Labrador and then staying in that cold area for uh, Lab City up through the northern portion of Labrador. And behind that we get into that northwesterly flow again, which means things should change right back over to snow uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then head towards the coast as that low pulls off but then clearing in behind it thanks to a ridge of high pressure. Otherwise, uh, for most of the island, we're looking at that potential for some snow along the west coast. Otherwise, we're looking at a mix of sun and cloud and things are going to stay quite nice. It looks like into Tuesday as well. So taking a look at the forecast quickly uh, over the next five days, we're going to see uh, temperatures sitting between 8 and 10 degrees through Sunday, Monday, 12 and windy with that potential for some showers. And then we get into some clear skies again for Tuesday and Wednesday with those temperatures hovering around 1 and 4 degrees. For central Newfoundland, same thing with those temperatures in the teens through Monday and then dipping down Wednesday, we'll see a return of those warmer temperatures. Same for western Newfoundland, rain changing to snow for Monday night, and that's because those temperatures are going to dip. And then up through Labrador, there's that uh, 10 to or 15 to 20 centimeters rather on Sunday, and then changing over to uh, back over to snow on Monday. And then same thing for western Labrador with flurries right through uh, Wednesday, really, but temperatures recovering quite nicely. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. All right, time now for a little bit of excitement and style, which is the perfect segue to get to our reporter Meg Roberts, who's reporting live from the rooms. That's where designers are rushing around right now. As you can tell, a fair bit of noise and action. There's a multicultural fashion show on. So they're going to be starting soon, Meg. How's it going down there? Yeah, we're about 10 minutes from the start. Makeup's done, hair is done, all the outfits are on. And as you can see, it is packed. There are so many people here. They're expecting hundreds. They say they might even have to close the door at the room because so many people want to check out the beautiful outfits. Uh, now, this uh, show is uh, put on by the Creative Sewing Atelier. It's a program that teaches newcomers how to sew. And tonight, we get to see their final productions. I spoke with some of the designers before the show. They said they've never sewn before. Uh, and they're very proud of their work. They said it's hard starting in a new city and a new country, uh, and this sewing club has really uh, kind of made them step out of their bubble and, and get involved. So it looks like it's going to be a very nice night at the rooms. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Meg Roberts for Here and Now. It's a really busy place. Thanks, Meg.
Welcome back, and it's Friday. Yep, so let's get to the real reason you tune in tonight. It's time to look at who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Wishing Albert and Shirley Pear in Pasadena a happy 55th wedding anniversary next Wednesday, April the 3rd. And a happy 55th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Anthony and Patricia Kane in Mount Pearl. Happy 90th birthday tomorrow to Thelma Keo in Plate Cove East, originally from Burlington. And a happy 96th birthday to Eileen Arnold in Tradetown, who celebrated yesterday. Happy 90th birthday to Peter Hall from Newtown, who celebrated his birthday on Tuesday. Happy 97th birthday to twins Alice Clark in Paradise and Mabel Daw in CBS. And another happy 97th birthday greeting, this one going out to Mary Slaney in St. Lawrence, who celebrated yesterday. Happy 53rd anniversary to Ephraim and Dot Hiscock in Trinity. Pat and Marguerite Whalen in Pasadena had their 68th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Congratulations. And a happy 63rd wedding anniversary as well to Garland and Stella Perry in Cornerbrook. They celebrated yesterday. Also yesterday, happy 50th anniversary to Reuben and Marilyn Rowe in Chance Cove. Happy 62nd anniversary to Beryl and Andrew Blackwood in Gander, who celebrated last week on the 20th. Happy 55th anniversary tomorrow to John and Rita Piercy in Galtus. Happy 91st birthday greeting to Lydia Hiscock in Victoria. She celebrated on Monday. Tomorrow, Ursula Chambers in Blue Cove will be celebrating her 93rd birthday. And happy 90th birthday to Ogle Spurl in St. Phillips, who celebrated Sunday, March 24th. And a happy 94th birthday to Lucy Boyd in Port Saunders. Her big day was Wednesday. And a happy birthday to Donald Burton in Fortune, who celebrated his 93rd birthday yesterday. And a happy 52nd wedding anniversary to Albert and Dina Coombs from Cornerbrook. Their big day is next Thursday, April the 4th. And a happy 61st anniversary yesterday to George and Nancy Hemian in Botwood. And a happy 52nd anniversary this Sunday to Curtis and Clara Ford of Island Harbor, Fogo Island. Happy 57, uh, 52nd wedding anniversary to Fraser and Betty Moss of Lethbridge. They celebrated on Wednesday. Wishing John and Phoebe Farrell in St. John's a very happy 60th diamond wedding anniversary this Sunday. More diamond anniversary wishes for Reverend Royden and Jeanette Reynolds from Grand Falls, Windsor, who celebrated on Tuesday. And happy 99th birthday yesterday to Rita O'Brien, formerly from Cape Royal, now living in Fermuse. And happy birthday to Vivian Kendall in Twillingate, originally from Ramia. She celebrated her 97th birthday on Tuesday. And happy birthday wishes as well to Rita Fitzgerald of St. John's, who celebrated her 96th birthday on March 27th. Rita is a big wrestling fan. And a happy 91st birthday to Donald Freak of Boyd's Cove, who celebrated on Tuesday, March 26th. And a happy 94th birthday, rather, greetings to Harriet Saunders of Point Leamington. Happy 91st birthday tomorrow to Ruth Parsons. And finally, happy 65th wedding anniversary to Donald and Joan Hammond this Sunday. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, now to a topic that always comes up this time of year, certainly in town and different parts of the island for sure. The weekends here, weather's not so bad. If you're heading out on a road trip the next few days, keep your eyes out for potholes. Nelson Bragg sent us a warning about this pothole located about 25 kilometers outside of Port Basque. How big is it? Well, there you go. That's a 450 gram block of cheese. Yes, cheese standing comfortably inside the pothole. And you could certainly spend a lot of cheddar on a busted rim or a blown tire. So make sure to look out. It is that season that's upon us, as uh, you no doubt know. And uh, we'll be seeing more stories, I suspect. So we just got to get Nelson to show up with uh, like a wheelbarrow full of crackers uh, to go with that. <laughs> to eat that. Good uh, sense of perspective there. Yes, certainly is. Yeah, I so wouldn't want to get careful. in that. Yeah, not yeah. a good idea. I want to pop a rim. Mm -hmm. You got a photo. I do have a weather okay. photo. A beautiful weather photo. I mean, they're all beautiful, but this one specifically. Look at how gorgeous that oh, shot that is. That is nice. Lovely colors. A sunset taken uh, on the Avalon, actually. On the Avalon. Uh, let's say Beachy Cove. Mm, Where are we? Nope. It was just Inception outside Bay Paradise. South. All right. Yeah. Yep. This beautiful shot was sent to us by uh, Wayne Hebb. Horse and Cove Brook. Horse Cove, Cove Brook, yeah. He gave me the directions. I'm not going to give you the directions because I want to go <laughs> check this place out. But uh, a beautiful sunset there. Thank you so much for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. 
All right, well, uh, here now has gone by pretty fast this week. All right, Carolyn Stokes will be back uh, well, sometime in the future. Yep. She'll offer a bit of time off that mm -hmm. she has earned. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for watching. I'm going to go home and uh, make some seal food, I think. Sounds good. I'm inspired. <laughs> Aren't you? Yep. <laughs> Not very convinced. Have a great weekend. Good night.